We are going through the book of 1 Corinthians, verse by verse, every week. Uh, we are in chapter 3. Our text will be verses 18 to the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul writes, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is is God's. There are two stories in the Old Testament, very similar one to the other, even though they're separated by over a thousand years. The story of Joseph in the book of Genesis, son of Jacob, and the story of Daniel, the prophet. Uh, in both cases, we have a situation where the king Pharaoh in one instance and King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon in the other, they have dreams that they call, and they want someone to explain it to them and uh, all their counselors and all their magicians and their wise men can't explain the dream. And in both cases someone says, you know, there's a guy there who, who can do it and Joseph comes, Daniel comes and both kings ask, can you interpret dreams? And both men basically give the same answer, which is no. And you're like, what? What just happened? And they say, but there's a God in heaven who can. What's that? Why didn't they just say, yeah, I can, yeah, these guys can't interpret dreams. I can interpret dreams. Let me just tell you what the dream. Why doesn't he do that? Why don't they do that? They don't want anyone to think that, well, we're smarter than everyone else. We have a higher IQ than everyone else. We're better than everyone else. We're, we're wiser than everyone else. They want to know that if the, you know, we, don't, we don't have some kind of power in and of ourselves, but it's God who deserves to be praised and revered and thanked for the revealing of this dream. He's the one who has revealed it, and I'm just the messenger. I'm just a servant. Why am I telling you those stories? Well, this is a lesson that the Corinthian church needed to learn. In our passage today, um, these verses on their own, if you haven't read what's been going on thus far, it'll, they'll be difficult to understand, but if we explain what's been going on, they're quite simple to understand. Um, our passage today are the concluding, or some of the concluding remarks that Paul makes after having said all kinds of stuff one big argument in chapters 1, 2, and 3 from the beginning of the letter. Just turn one page or two to chapter 1 um, and look at verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Those are the really spiritual ones. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's going on here? The church in Corinth was splitting into little groups. Into little cliques. And each group centered around a specific teacher. And they said, we are followers of this guy. Instead of saying we're followers of Christ, or, uh, they would be like, we're followers of Paul. Or we're followers of uh, Apollos. I belong to Cephas. That's... Peter. And what they were doing was each group would look down upon the other groups. Because my guy is better than your guy. And therefore my group is better than your group. And in a way I'm kind of better than you in that sense because I was smart enough to go with a better group. All right? So they're just boasting in men, boasting themselves. The entire book of 1 Corinthians is full of Paul uh, <laughs> telling them to stop boasting and everything they have. On top of that, because this was, these past three chapters have been, there's a number of things that Paul addressed. On top of that, the reason 
that each one, each person in the church is attaching himself to a, a certain uh, teacher is infuriating because it's not that the people in the church were saying, okay, who has the best theology? Who's most biblical? And I'll go with him. No, that would actually be a relatively, relatively good thing. But uh, that's not what they're doing. They are separating into groups based upon who they think is the best public speaker. All right? Because look, all these men that are mentioned here, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, all of these were great teachers. All of them were biblical. They all had the same theology. So they're not disagreeing on theology here, these, these little groups. They're disagreeing on who is the best public speaker. Why? Because this was a huge thing in ancient Greece. Ancient Greeks loved the, the philosophers, the sophists, and the rhetoricians, whatever. People who would stand up and speak and they were so amazing and people were like, wow, they're just so wise and fantastic. Many times they may have been speaking complete rubbish, but it sounded so good. It sounded so learned, so wise, and people loved it. And the people in the church who lived in that culture, that's what they wanted from their preachers. We want the best speakers, the guy who's most engaging, most interesting. And so they're splitting the church into little groups based upon who has the best preacher, based on the world standards of what best preaching is, of what best speaking is. And so Paul has spent the first three chapters explaining that the goal of a Christian pastor is not um, to sound as good as possible by the world standards. <laughs> All right? The world should not be loving the me the world does not love the message of Christianity. Uh, the, the, the Christian pastor's job is to clearly and correctly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is not a message that the world loves. The world doesn't want to hear you're sinners who need to repent. And your only hope is this man who died on a cross. People are like, no way. That's, that's ridiculous. If you remember in chapter 1, he dealt with this. And he said, we preach Christ and Him crucified. To the Jew it's a stumbling block, and to the Greek it's foolishness. It's foolishness. You're telling me that some poor Jewish guy who died on a cross is my only way of salvation? You're telling me that that guy over there is the Lord of heaven and earth, the guy who was crucified by the Romans? That's ridiculous. It's foolishness. The key phrase in our passage is verse 21. The, verse, the first sentence. Therefore, it's this conclusion of everything he's been saying. Therefore, let no one boast in men. That's where he wants to get to. Let no one boast in men. I don't want to hear that there's divisions among you and you're saying, well, I follow him. Was he crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. So I don't want to hear any of this boasting in men. When you're boasting in men, you're robbing God of His glory because He's the one who built the church. He's the one who gives the Spirit. He's the one who saves. And He should be honored above all, not men. And so in our passage today, Paul is going to give us a few reasons why we should not be boasting in men or in the wisdom of men. So, starting off in verse 18. He says, let no one deceive himself. Well, how are they deceiving themselves? If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. How are they deceiving themselves? They were deceiving themselves by thinking that they were wise because by the world standards they were wise. Not by God's standards. God didn't think they were wise. But they thought they were wise based upon the world's standards of what is wise and what is not. And Paul is saying, if you, and Paul says, if you think you're wise, you first need to become a fool in order to be wise. And you're like, what, what, is, what does that mean? Again, it's the same thing that he talked about in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul made this statement. He said, the world, through its wisdom did not know God. Everyone in the world, then in 
everyone today, always, everyone in the world has some kind of idea of how life should be lived. And if everyone just lived the way that I think they should live, everything would be great. I know people who think the answer to everything is the government. If we just had, like, absolute, like communism, let's do it, and we would have a utopia. There are others who say, no, it's the exact opposite. We don't need any government, and everyone can just do what we want to do, and then we would have a utopia. There are others who say, no, it's, it's, into, it's, about, um, it's about health. If you just eat right and exercise, that's what life is all about. Then everyone will be healthy and happy and everything would be great. Uh, everyone has some kind of philosophy, some kind of worldview. If everyone just listened to me and they were clever enough and we could just do what we need to do, everything would be wonderful. And Paul, back in chapter 1, said, all of the world's wise men all of the world's philosophers, all of the world's great thinkers could never solve our biggest problem, which is sin. No one could ever tell us how to be reconciled to God. No one. They can't do it. The world, by its wisdom, did not know God. Instead, God chose to save the world. How? By sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die on a cross to pay for our sins. What the Greeks thought was foolishness, madness, crazy. And Paul here, where he says, if you think you're wise, you need to become a fool in order to become wise. What, what does he mean by that? He is saying, if you want to be really wise, because you're, now you may be wise according to this age, but I'm talking about real wisdom. If you want to be really wisdom, you've got to become a fool according to the world. The world thinks that the gospel is foolish. They think it's ridiculous. Well, if you want to be really wise, you've got to be a fool compared to... It, it, the rest of the world should think you're a fool. Because that's not how they think. Because that's real wisdom. You see, he says, don't deceive yourselves. If you think you're wise by the world's standards, if the world thinks that you're wise... You need to become a fool. Because the gospel, which the world thinks is foolish, is the only wisdom that matters eternally. Eternally. It has value. Nothing else can save you. Nothing that the world can produce, no system that the world can produce by its own wisdom can save you. They think that the gospel is foolishness and Paul says, well, guess what? Then we need to become fools. Because that's the only real wisdom. What the world thinks is foolish. The wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world. I know people can build all kinds of amazing things. The wisdom of the world can get people to the moon. But it can't save anyone. So, verse 19. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. All right, the whole world is running around trying, we're trying to make the world a better place. Trying to get richer and healthier and prosper and build things and do all these things and those are all right on their own. But without God, God is sitting there going, how foolish can you be to give your entire life to something which doesn't have eternal value, which won't take you further into eternity, which can't save you. That is foolishness. What is the point of living... Well, I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. What is the point of living until you're 120 with wonderful health and money and then you die and go to hell for eternity? That's foolishness. And Paul wants to prove his point that the wisdom of the world is foolish. And he quotes two scriptures. Uh, middle of verse 19, he says, For it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. I love how, and that's all he says, I love how Paul doesn't need to make any other argument here. His argument is, the Bible says so. All right, he doesn't go any further than that. <laughs> he doesn't explain this any further. He says, you want, you want me to prove to you that the world's wisdom is foolish and that God thinks it's foolish? Well, the Bible says so. All right, that, that's basically his argument. <laughs> I kind of like that. Um, first, 
first one that he quotes is from the book of Job. He says he catches the wise in their own craftiness. People think they're so clever, and crafty, and they think they're going to get away with whatever it is they're doing, but God can just, he knows everything they're doing, and he grabs them, stops them from doing what, it, what they're doing. Uh, like I said, this is from the book of Job. As a quick side note, as a quick side note, these are words of one of Job's friends, Eliphaz. Now, usually, when we think of Job's friends, when they're talking to Job, we think of them as being dumb, they don't know what they're talking about, they, sh they shouldn't be saying what they're saying. They need to be careful. They were wrong, why? It's not that what they were saying was not true, in principle. Practically everything that his friends say to Job, if you know the story, is true in principle. They were wrong because it didn't apply to Job. All right? That's the mistake that they were making. But Paul is taking the principle which is true. And he says, yeah, God catches, catches them in their craftiness. They think they can get away with stuff, but they can't because God is much smarter than them. And then he gives us Psalm 94 where he says, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile vain, empty. The Hebrew word is like vapor. The wise think they're so great, but their thoughts are like vapor. Just kind of gone. See it for a moment, it's gone. It has no lasting importance. No lasting significance. So Paul says, stop thinking like the world. You're not going to get anywhere. The wisdom of the world, you're not going it's to... A, it's a dead end road. You're not, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're not going to get somewhere important rather than destruction. Therefore, and here's his conclusion, verse 21, Therefore, let no one boast in men. They were exalting in the wisdom of their teachers. They were exalting in their own wisdom because they were smart enough to align themselves with those teachers. And he says, just stop. Stop boasting in men. And he's going to give us a reason why they should stop. One more reason. And this is fascinating. It's a fascinating reason. I never would have come up with this. Listen to his argument now. Here's why you should stop boasting in men. Here's why you should not say, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, and so forth. Right? Rest of verse 21. He says, For, because, all things are yours. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. First of all, he says, you keep saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos. Uh, actually, you got it the wrong way around. They belong to you. Alright? They have been given to the church as gifts for the edifying of the church. All these pastors, preachers, Teaches, what does it say in Ephesians 4? All these uh, evangelists and all these people have been given as gifts from God to the church to grow the church up. Alright? So, you, they are there to minister to you. They are there to serve you. All of them. Not just one or two. So, you're actually kind of selling yourself short by saying, well, I want this guy. When you have all these other guys who are also could give you a lot of good stuff. Alright? That's the first step of the argument. He says, you're, you kind of got it the wrong way around. Because they all belong to you. But he takes it way further than that. <laughs> way further than that. He says, you know, Paul is yours, Apollos is yours, Cephas is yours. And then he says, all things are yours. The world, life, death, present, future, everything is yours. What does that mean? <laughs> Most Christians, sadly, have a very poor view of salvation, I think. I don't know most. A lot. A lot of Christians have a very poor view of salvation. They view pretty much salvation like, alright, there's heaven and hell, and you get saved, you go to heaven, you don't get saved, you go to hell. That's pretty much the extent of it. There is so much more <laughs> to salvation in Christ. Everything that Adam lost in the fall, Christ wins it back for us. The fullness of our salvation 
is not just the fact that He saved your soul when you believed. He is going to save your body when He resurrects you from the dead on the last day. And He is going to renew this entire world where we're going to have a new heavens and a new earth where you can live for eternity in a sinless world. Not just a sinless person. Sinless person surrounded by other sinless people in a sinless world. How about that? He says, all are yours. I think this may be a paraphrase of Romans 8. Let me give you two verses from Romans 8. Listen to these words. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, right now, all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to His purpose. And then a couple of verses later, in verse 32, he says, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? All things. If you're a Christian, right now, in this world, in this life, in the present, God is working all things together for your good. And your good, your ultimate good, is your ultimate salvation. You may say, well, what about the bad things that happen? <sighs> whether it's sickness or health, whether it's pain or relief, whether it's uh, riches or poverty or whatever it is, God is working all things right now as we speak to bring you to absolute salvation in the end. To work everything for your ultimate good. Right now. And if you die before the Lord comes back, guess what? Well, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You go get, get to be with the Lord. And if the Lord comes back, whether you've died or not, He is going to renew this earth and give it to you, to His people, as an inheritance. Forever. So everything now that is going on in the world is for you. And everything that is going to come in the future is going to be inherited by you. And you're arguing about which preacher is more interesting than the other one. Really? They're all yours. The most interesting ones and the less interesting ones, they're all yours anyway. Everything is yours. And you're boasting about, oh, my guy is better than your guy. You're splitting the church over these things. Now, to close off this section... Since Paul knows that the Corinthians are prone to boast, he's thinking, oh wait, hold on. I just told people that everything is theirs. So the Corinthians may go, wow, look how amazing I am. I own everything. So he's like, hold on, hold on. Verse 23, by the way, and you are Christ's. Maybe all these teachers are yours and maybe the world is yours. It's been given to you, but you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Yes, all things are yours, but that's because you are Christ. If you're not Christ, all things are not yours, first of all. And second of all, um, the reason everything is yours is because Christ won it for you. Okay? It's not that you're so amazing and now everything is yours. No, Christ is so amazing who by His grace gave it to you. All right? Just so we have that clear. So no boasting <laughs> in men. Christ gives everything by His grace. And Christ is of God. Is God's. He is God's Messiah. He's the one that God sent to accomplish all of this. So, to close. The Corinthians were boasting in men, boasting in people. And you may say, well, good thing we don't do that. Maybe we don't boast in our preachers. We boast in our parents. We boast in our ancestors. Know who I am. We boast in our children. We boast in our favorite sports teams. We boast for ourselves, for what we've achieved, how many books we've read, how educated we are, and all these things, and on and on. And when that happens, we're doing the same thing that the Corinthians were doing. We're focusing on man instead of God. That's the problem. And when you find yourself doing that, boasting about yourself or someone else, we need to shift our focus from ourselves or from men to Christ who has accomplished our salvation by Himself. To Christ who has given us all things. If you have anything, it is because Christ has given it to you.
Let me close with these words by the Apostle Paul. Back in chapter 1, he said these words. I'll paraphrase. He said, if you want to boast in someone, that's fine. Boast in the Lord. Because He alone is worthy. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.